it. Welcome to Welcome to our seminar, uh, our last seminar on open science for this academic year. Uh, this seminar, seminar has been organized by the Italia Reproducibility Network. As usually, uh, I begin by thanking the AIP, the Italian Association of Psychology, that is supporting us with the, by hosting uh, these seminars uh, on their uh, Zoom account. Uh, um, well, uh, as usual, I remember, I also remind you that uh, uh, you can subscribe to the Italian Reproducibility Network by uh, using the link that is on the uh, slide. And uh, regarding our activities, I also remind you that next week we have the first hands-on seminar of the Italian Reproducibility Network. This one will be on uh, pre-registration on uh, June the 9th. Um, well, finally, you uh, okay people those people who have uh, uh, followed all of our seminars already, of course, they already know it, but uh, I'll uh, repeat it again for maybe the new people. Uh, we we have uh, will have a question session in the end, and uh, uh, the questions of doctoral students uh, as usual have priority. And uh, Federica Conte will moderate this question and answer session. And in the chat, you'll find some information about uh, the organization of this uh, uh, final session. Now, uh, today's seminar. Today's seminar, uh, today we, I'm very happy that we have uh, Felix Schembrock from the University of München. Uh, Felix is doing um, various types of research. For instance, he's investigating implicit uh, motives and their measurement, implicit motives and uh, how they work in close relations and this kind of stuff. But also uh, more related to um, open science, it's uh, an amazing research that he is, is at the beginning, if I understood it correctly, is a big project on uh, a big meta research project to simulate a more trustworthy, trustworthy sorry, <laughs> academic system and uh, with an agent-based uh, modeling approach. Um, Felix is highly active and highly committed regarding the various aspects of open science. Uh, for example, uh, talking about previous projects, uh, um, the robustness of findings included, but not limited to the psychometric aspects and power, which we was a topic of uh, the previous encounter. Um, yeah, research assessment uh, proposals uh, that are, um, as I mentioned in this uh, meta research project, that regard how to do things better in science, how to improve uh, science, basically. And well, uh, open science metrics and career is the title of uh, his uh, seminar today. And as usual, I keep it very short. And uh, so the stage is uh, yours, Felix. Thank you for being here. Yeah, so thank you very much for this nice introduction and thanks for, for the invitation. It's so cool to see all the, all the energy and activity in the Italian network uh, and it was a great series of lectures. And today, yeah, I want to talk about research assessment and responsible research assessment, how we could do it better than we do it uh, now at the moment and how that relates to the careers, especially of early career researchers. So I want to talk about three main topics today. The first thesis is that our, our current indicators for research quality do a really bad job, um, that these indicators and incentives foster actually bad research. And in the third part, I'd like to give an outlook to some ideas how we could do a more responsible research assessment and how we could realign good scientific practice, open science, and the incentive structures. So let's go to the first point our current indicators do a bad job. I'd like you to take a look at this distribution of values. And now if you had to decide which single number is the best number to describe this distribution, now you can make a guess which is the best single number. I can show it to you. Quite obviously, this is the best number to describe the distribution. Um, so what is that? That is the distribution of citations uh, in the journal Science. 
So we have the number of papers here and how often they have been cited in the last two years. And the journal impact factor is the average number of citations of papers from a journal in the last two years. In this case, the journal impact factor is 35. That's the average number of citations. But as you can see, this single number is not a good descriptor of the distribution. So uh, three quarters of the papers have less citations. 2% are never cited. Um, and now this is science. If you go to like normal journals like PLOS One or eLife and other journals, around 10 to 30% of all papers never get cited uh, within the first two years. Well, okay, so that's one of the problems of the journal impact factor. The number from a statistical point of view doesn't make too much sense. But if you put that aside for the moment, um, the original intention of the impact factor was that it is a tool to help university librarians to decide which journals they should purchase. And for that task, probably the impact factor isn't too bad. The problem is that the impact factor, which is now a proprietary algorithm owned by Clary, Clarivate, you know, that's, that's a company, it's not externally verifiable. So you cannot really reproduce the numbers that they tell you. Uh, the problem is that this indicator for librarians has been misused for another purpose. It's intended to be a shortcut to evaluate research quality. Now, the question is, does that work? And the answer is a very clear no. Um, I will now show you a couple of evidence and all of that has been cited uh, in, a, in two papers by Björn Brems. So he's on a crusade against the, the impact factor and he has collected a lot of evidence about the problems. So here's one example. Uh, in some fields, you can have an objective quantification of the quality of a research. You seem to be able to do that in crystallography. So I have no idea about how that works. But what they have found is that the higher the impact factor, the lower is the objective quality. You can see it here. So this is a quality measure. Lower is better in this case. And you can see all these big names like nature, science, and cell are on the top uh, part of the distribution with the lowest quality of all journals. Um, several studies have found a negative relationship between the impact factor and statistical power or sample size, at least in psychology. So higher impact factor means lower sample size. And we have a positive relationship between impact factor and objective errors of gene names. Maybe you heard about these problems. If you store gene names in an Excel sheet, uh, Excel converts them sometimes to say a date. Uh, so then it's January the 1st, uh, which makes no sense. It's an objective error and you can count these errors and we have more of these errors in higher impact factor channels. Um, well, there's a positive relationship to retractions and uh, in vivo animal experimentation studies, they are less randomized in higher ranking channels. So overall, there's a lot of evidence that if there's any relationship, so many relationships to quality measures are zero between impact factor and them. And if there's a relationship, it's either zero or negative. So it seems to be really a bad index for quality of a single paper. Now you could say, well, okay, impact factor, but double-blind peer review certainly is the hallmark of scientific quality control. So that should work, right? Uh, well, it doesn't work as good as we hope it is. <laughs> so here's one, one classic study. Um, Peters and Chechi in 1982, they took 12 articles which had already been published and resubmitted them in the original form to the same journal around one to five to two years after their publication. Now, the funny thing is for nine of these, out of these 12 papers, the journals did not even notice <laughs> that they have printed exactly this paper two years ago. And from these nine papers, which have been resubmitted, eight have been rejected. Although it's exactly the same paper that they already uh, accepted. So it seems like reviewers and editors have a quite a low retest reliability. Now, okay, 12 papers, that's more like an anecdotal evidence. Here is meta-analytic evidence from 48 studies with nearly 20,000 manuscripts. And they looked at the reliability 
and the uh, inter-rater agreement if you have multiple raters of the same paper. What they found is a reliability with an intra-class correlation of 0.48 and a couple of 0.77. Now that looks really cool. Actually, that was a joke. No, uh, it's not. <laughs> so these are the real numbers. The previous numbers are what we would expect probably. Uh, these are the real numbers. Uh, and a kappa of 0.17, if we take a short look at the benchmark table, you can see it's in the lowest category of agreement. Strength of agreement is quite poor. So it's close to zero. So reviewers looking at the same paper usually do not agree about the quality of the paper. Uh, and this low shared variance of agreement isn't actually that what we are looking at or that what we want, because the agreement about the shared values is not really the agreement about the true value of a paper. So even if two uh, reviewers think, okay, this has good properties, the paper, maybe you aim slightly next to the, the, the true value. So if we calculate that in, there has been a, a study, a paper by Starbuck, um, they computed that the uh, mean correlation of the reviews assessment with the true value is only around 0.18. Yeah, it has been argued that the decisions given this, this low inter-rater agreement is actually like a lottery. You could throw a dice or a coin and it isn't much worse, the decision that you get uh, from that. Uh, and this is not a new phenomenon. Uh, here's a nice quote from Sir Theodore Fox, uh, who was the editor of The Lancet. The Lancet, one of the most popular journals, the most important journals in medicine. And he said already in 1965, when I divide the week's contributions into two piles, one that are we going to publish and the other we are going to return, I wonder whether it would make any real difference to the journal or its readers if I exchanged one pile for the other. So there's so much uncertainty and randomness in the process. As a summary, um, this is my personal conclusion from all that. I think that pre-publication peer review in the current system has a value as feedback. So I regularly get reviews that, that help me to improve the manuscript. It's useful feedback, but it has virtually no value as quality control. Uh, and it is very inefficient for that. Here's another case study. Um, does peer review select better researchers? And this is a really interesting case study about the Emmy Noether program in Germany. So the German Research Foundation has this really prestigious program. Uh, that's what they write themselves about the program. It gives exceptionally qualified early career researchers, really the best of the best, the chance to qualify for the post of a professor at a university. And they get, if, if they are elected, they get around one to 1.5 million euros. Um, in the study, they looked at the trajectories of applicants and they compared two groups, applicants who got rejected, which are the, the white circles here, and the dark circle, the dark squares are applicants who got accepted for the program and they received 1.5 million roughly. So here where the zero is, that was the uh, point in time where the decision was made that they get the money. So before that decision, the groups are probably comparable. And now they are we're interested to see how they develop. So if you select really the best of the best, give them 1.5 million euros, you would expect that they probably perform better than the other group who was not selected and gets not 1 million euros. And they looked at the number of publications. And here are two, um, two fields, biology and chemistry. And what they found is that there's no real difference between these two groups in their trajectory. Well, OK, of course, we could say we do not look at quantity. So the quantity of publications, we're not interested in that. We look at the quality. So uh, the elected, exceptionally qualified, certainly published in better journals, right? So how do we uh, decide which journals are better? Well, of course, we use the impact factor. Uh, so here's the average impact factor of publications. 
as you can see, there's no real difference between these two groups. Okay, but we know that the impact factor is a miserable indicator of quality. At least these exceptionally qualified researchers should receive more citations, right? Well, again, not really. And so the um, authors of this study came to the conclusion, to the interesting conclusion that taken together, the bibliometric results show remarkably small differences between funded and rejected applicants prior to funding. And moreover, these small differences are not increased by the fact that one of both groups gets, gets a funding of 1 million euro and the other doesn't. So um, what can we conclude? This extremely costly peer review procedure with multiple rounds, many, many dozens of reviewers invested hours and days of, of the work, it's probably made no difference. We could have made a random selection and probably it would have, have been equally valid, just a lottery. Now, Next thesis, number two, our current incentives foster bad research. Here's another quote from another editor from The Lancet. Now, a few years later, Richard Horton said that much of the scientific literature, perhaps half, may simply be untrue. Uh, I think he said that, so I don't have the date of the quote, but I think he said that already before all these uh, large replication projects came out. So he had quite a good uh, intuition about the replication rate, that half is probably untrue. Uh, and the part of the problem is that no one is incentivized to be right. So we are incentivized to get things published, not to um, create valid knowledge. So what are our actual incentives? Um, we have a quite clear picture uh, how it looks like in psychology because there was a huge uh, survey um, in the German Psychological Society and they asked I think 1600 people where most of them had been members of hiring committees so they know what they are talking about and they asked them what what properties what criteria um, have the highest relevance in professorship hiring committees and not the desired relevance, but the actual relevance. Now you can guess what is the single most important thing to get a professorship position. Well, it's the number of peer reviewed publications, first rank. Then the second, well, it's a fit of the profile to the institution. I think that's a, that's a valid criterion then the quality of the research talk, but then it goes on the number of publications, the volume of third party funding and the number of first authorships. Um, other fields put more emphasis on the outlets. So in economics, for example, they talk about the tyranny of the top five journals. So they have these five big journals uh, and a single publication in one of these big five uh, sometimes makes a difference between getting tenure or getting kicked out of academia. So it's a slightly different incentive structure, but I would say that it's equally invalid for um, choosing good quality research. So if we uh, focus back on the ranking uh, of psychology, we can ask, how do you get a lot of publications? If this is the single most criterion for the early career researchers amongst you, well, how do you get that? Well, here we have a, a couple of publications looking into that. Uh, they have funny names already, the rules of the game. So academia is not about creating knowledge. It's a game we have to play to succeed. And here are the evolution of bad science. And they come to the conclusion, which is quite obvious, actually, the ideal strategy for a high quantity of publications is do small studies because then you can do more studies and have maybe a lucky, a lucky guess or a, a, a lucky false positive. So small n, many studies, apply some questionable research practices such as p-hacking, and that seems to be an ideal strategy to get a lot of publications. And unfortunately, for my field, psychology, I think that strategy really describes an not untypical research behavior in my field in, I don't know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago. 
So here's my uh, summary of the first two points. So my thesis is that our current incentives foster questionable research practices, which decrease the truth value of our shared knowledge. So we have seen the problem in the many failed replication studies. What is good for the individual careers of a researcher leads to a collective fiasco. Um, so we have the, the, the structure of a social dilemma. Um, and I think that really makes me sad and angry at the same time, researchers who do it right, that means who have large samples, who do not cheat uh, in their data analysis and so on, they have a clear competitive disadvantage. And these questionable research practices are actually used as a doping drug. So it has been compared to doping in sports. Here's my anti-thesis. Society pays for us that we generate valid and robust knowledge, and we could be better at that. Our incentives should be chosen in a way that they foster good science and not bad science, and researchers who do it right, they should be supported and promoted. So if we uh, talk about doping, here's a quote from Lance Armstrong. As you all know, uh, he's not running <laughs> Uh, the Tour de France anymore, but he said, it's impossible to win the Tour de France without doping. And my fear is, and I sometimes get the impression that this is like um, the feelings of the early career researchers today, at least in some fields. Um, sometimes when I give workshops on open science, um, the, the organizers ask the participants for anonymous questions. So they, they can hand in questions anonymously. And it's important to make it anonymous because then it's much more uh, like, yeah, open and uh, less restricted. So they, they say what they really think. And here are some quotes. And these are really actual quotes that, that I got. So one of the PhD students said, with which mindset do we conduct research? Is it our goal to find new truth or to be successful by confirming our hypotheses? What would be a good balance between open science and pursuing a career in science? <laughs> so it seems like you, you cannot do both. <laughs> Can you only really afford doing open science with tenure? So that, that's, a, that's an idea I often hear. So, okay, we have to play the game until we have tenure and then, then we can really do the proper research that we want to do actually. Uh, the problem is when I talk to people like that, that now have tenure, <laughs> I often hear, yeah, I'd like to do it, but I have to care about my PhD students. So in order to get more funding for them, not for me, for them, I have to publish, publish, publish to get the funding and they have to publish in Nature and the good journals, otherwise they won't have a career and so on. And there's not really a change in behavior after tenure. Open science makes me transparent, but also very vulnerable. Is it really worth it? Or my contract is limited to two years. Although it would be nice to publish the data, I have no time to do it. I rather have to churn out another publication. So what you see in all these uh, quotes is, is the felt contradiction between good research or open research and having a career in science. Now, one possible reaction to that is that you say, well, well this is fine. <laughs> I have gone through all of this shit. Uh, the next generation has to do it as well. Um, but I don't, th I don't think <laughs> that this is fine. And as this event is also targeted at PhD students, early career researchers like you often lift the heavy work of good research practice. I mean, who documents the, the open data sets? You document the open data sets. You write the pre-registrations. And you learn the new skills to produce those fancy reproducible manuscripts. I don't know how many PIs do that. So you are doing the heavy work of open, good research. Um, and I think we senior researchers, we must not leave you alone with that dilemma of doing good research versus having a career. So this is really a call out to the senior researchers, those who sit in the committees, those who make the rules of hiring, tenure and promotion. We have to solve that dilemma. Um, otherwise it's just unfair and uh, the, the whole 
open science movement and, and movement for good scientific practice will come to a stop if those people who do it right get selected out of academia. So that's nothing that we would want. So getting to my last point, we need responsible research assessments that this situation stops and does not happen. And I want to present some ideas how to realign good scientific practice and the incentive structure. What I present now is not really new and there's an amazing amount of uh, initiatives working right now at this moment to improve the situation. So the mother of all initiatives is DORA, the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment. This is, I don't know, 10, 15 years old now. Uh, and they have one single point, do not use the journal impact factor for the assessment of individual researchers. Um, one criticism of DORA was, okay, now you tell us what not to do, but what should we do instead? Um, now DORA has some spin-off projects where they try to tackle this question and there are more initiatives. So for example, just recently was the Paris call on research assessment. So the, the French um, presidency of the European Union, they really put a, a focus on open science. And they say the aim is for research to be evaluated based on its intrinsic merits rather than on the number of publications and where these are published. Um, in the Netherlands, they are really yeah, some steps forward often in these issues. They have the um, recognition and rewards initiatives, which also has the, the goal to diversify the indicators and the, the, the outputs of research that count. So not only publications should count, but other stuff such as teaching service to the field as well. Also recently, this January, uh, LERU, the League of European Research Universities, published uh, a position paper on the same topic. We had, sorry, we had the Hong Kong principles. And also in the European Union, uh, a big initiative who wants to, that, that wants to reform the research assessment system. So there's a lot of stuff going on um, and all, of, all have the, the, the goal to, to get to a concrete um, suggestion how we can do it. So it's very clear what not to do, but it's not so clear what else can we do. So if we want to get away from the quantity measures, we can get back to the survey uh, of the psychologists. And if you look at the very bottom of the ranking of the actual relevance of hiring committees, you see that the last uh, criterion are indicators of research transparency. From all of the 41 indicators, this is the lowest ranking of the actual relevance. But in the same study, they also asked the people about the desired relevance. What do you want to have as an indicator? And here are the five uh, indicators with the largest discrepancy between the actual value and the desired value. And you can see here, this is uh, leadership skills, uh, management skills, strategic thinking. So it's more like different um, dimensions of academic contributions. But for, for the core research uh, dimension, it's indicators of transparency, which have the largest discrepancy. So researchers, researchers actually want to have these indicators in hiring committees. They should play a role. And things are changing already. Um, in 2015, uh, in Munich, we, uh, I think for the first time, added um, a paragraph in, um, uh, in the job descriptions for open professorship positions. So here's the English translation. It says, the Department of Psychology aims for transparent and reproducible research, including open data, open materials, and pre-registrations. Applicants are asked to illustrate how they have pursued these goals in the past, past and or how they plan to do so in the future. So everybody has to write a section on that topic. Um, since 2015, we have added this paragraph into all of our, of our um, job ads. Uh, and 
A few years later, in 2018, we also made this an official policy of our department, so that we said we will always put it into these job descriptions. Um, in uh, a current committee, we, for the first time, also um, looked for indicators how we can rate the open science contributions of, a, of an applicant um, and compare them on this dimension. So we wanted to see, okay, we have seen this, this paragraph pop up quite often at different places all over the world. So we wanted to have a more like systematic view on that. And we looked at the German database of job offers in psychology. So it's the academics database. So it's uh, mostly focused on Germany. And they had 1,600 job ads from 2017 to 2020. So we looked, uh, we did a keyword search for some keywords here. And what we found is that out of 376 advertising institutions, 20 mentioned replicability or transparency at least once. Uh, across all years, 2.2% of job offers mentioned these topics. And we can see uh, a strong rise uh, across the years. So in 2020, it's nearly 4% of job ads already have this in. Now you could say, well, 4% isn't too much. I see it quite positive. So given that I would say five years ago or 10 years ago, not a single one mentioned this topic, well, it's an exponential rise. <laughs> so we all know exponential uh, um, rises now with the pandemic. So it really it will go up through the ceiling. <laughs> Let's see. So maybe now we can the analysis, so do the analysis of 2021 and see how it develops. Okay. So now here's my last part. Um, the German Psychological Society, they commissioned um, a task force uh, with the goal to develop a recommendation, how we could do a more responsible research assessment based on, on, on all of these initiatives that I've shown you before. And we currently are in the phase of pre preparing two papers. So one is uh, principles, how to implement DORA uh, in psychology. And we also um, want to give a really concrete proposal that you can use right away. So with all the forms and rules, how to code and score something and so on. So this is not uh, available yet, but here's already the link. So if you look at that link, you will find uh, both papers, the preprints, hopefully uh, in a few weeks. And we also did um, a paper within personality psychology, um, how quality may be rewarded more in research evaluation where many of the ideas already have been written up. Um, and that's, I really like that project. So that was a target paper. We got 20 commentaries on it and wrote a rejoinder. So if you have a lot of time and are interested, uh, I think it's fun to read. So what do we propose? In a nutshell, so I don't go into all of the details, but the first principle is that research output is multifaceted. Uh, maybe I should change it. Uh, it should not read research output, but academic contributions in the heading. Because research is just one area of academic contributions. We also do teaching. Um, leadership skills, such as mentoring, supervision, uh, management, strategic thinking. These are skills that are necessary for professorship positions. Service to the academic institution, to the university, or to the field. That's also a valuable contribution and societal impact like science communication. So all of these are important contributions and maybe it's hard to, to rank them. So we usually put the most uh, weight to the research dimension, but there might be different profiles at different institutions, which put probably more weight on teaching and societal impact. So if we zoom into the research dimension, we say we have multiple outputs. So, we, uh, so that's for the field of psychology. I think that applies to many empirical fields, but there could be differences between fields. So for psychology, we see three types of outputs. So these are really products uh, that, that you produce. 
Um, these are publications, published data sets, and research software development and maintenance. Uh, and here we have the contributor roles, so that is largely ignored at the moment. So once you are a co-author, the publication gets counted. Yeah. But we should not ignore what the applicant specifically has done for this particular uh, research pro uh, product. So the status quo is we look only at publications, ignoring the contributions and ignoring all of the other dimensions here of academic contributions. So the first call is look at publications and data sets and research software. And um, in the call for uh, uh, applications, uh, the, the call should explicitly say that applicants should list data sets and should list research software along with the publications. Here's the second principle. We need to clearly differentiate quality impact and quantity or productivity as independent evaluative dimensions. So in bibliometrics, if you read the papers from that field, quality is often equated or at least operationalized with the impact factor or citation-based measures. So a paper has a high quality if it's published in a high impact journal. Or if many people cite the paper, then it is high quality. Please don't do that. <laughs> uh, for us, in contrast, quality is an intrinsic property of the research output itself. So we need to look at the research output, at the paper, at the software, and see whether the research has been executed according to standards of good scientific practice. So that is quality. So if, for example, if citations are used as a proxy for quality, well, you have to wait at least two years before enough citations have the chance to accumulate. Um, but of course, we should be able to judge the quality of a research output even before it has been published. Yeah. So these are different things. Citations are rather an impact measure. So something can be of really good quality, but still have low citations. So for example, the paper from Peter Hicks, where he proposed the, the Hicks boson, well, now he has the Nobel Prize for that. That paper has been ignored for many years in the fields. I think even for decades, it got nearly no citations. They ignored it. And now it has the Nobel Prize. So there are many examples where you can find like this dissociation of quality and impact. Yeah, and then we have productivity. Um, so we have a pure quantity measure. So you can simply count the publications and you can get a productivity measure if you divide the, the, the absolute quantity by the resources. So it could either be, for example, divide by academic age, you know, then you have papers per year, or you could divide publications per uh, 100,000 euros of research funding. Because people who have a lot of research funding of course, we would expect them to publish more. But uh, if somebody has 10 millions of research funding and only has three papers more, we would say, well, with that money, you should have published more. So productivity well, is, is a relative measure of quantity. Now, if we differentiate these evaluation dimensions, we would say, okay, for all three research outputs, we have indicators and different indicators on all of these three dimensions. So for example, a real quality indicator of publications is whether it was a registered report or not. Because a pre-registration lowers the risk of bias and even more so in registered reports, because there we have an additional step of quality control, which we do not have in usual publications. So, CETA is paribus, um, everything equal, registered reports have a higher quality than non pre registered studies. Uh, I would say that computational reproducibility is a quality property of publications. So, I would expect that a high quality publication has the correct numbers in it, and there are no numerical errors in it. 
That means open data is a logical precondition to check the reproducibility of a study. And um, if studies provide the analysis scripts, so that, that the presence of, of code is the single best predictor of successful reproduction of the results. So I would say this is an intrinsic quality property. And there are more. Uh, for data sets, the fairness of the data set, we now have uh, rating scales where you can check how fair, findable, accessible, and so on, a data set is. So that is a quality property. Um, is the data set representative? For example, if you look at, at human populations, how large is it, and so on. Um, for software, a quality property if, is if there has been independent review of the software, if it has a good documentation. Um, yeah, and so on. Independent of the quality is the impact dimension. So I think citation counts are probably still one of the best indicators for impact. You can use that also for software and for data sets. For data sets, you can take a look how many other authors have reused your data set. That means how much research have you enabled by making your data public? and how much research would not have happened without your data set. Yeah, and then we have, of course, the quantity, which should be uh, evaluated on the applicant level. So that is our idea and some ideas for, for indicators of these different dimensions. Now, uh, we call for favoring quality over quantity. Um, so I, I would say that quantity should, should have a lower threshold. So if we look for um, professor professors uh, in a hiring committee, of course, we do not want somebody who never published or who published two papers in 10 years. So th there should be a lower threshold on quantity. Um, but beyond that, I would strongly focus on quality. And we suggest that it's only allowed to report 10 publications, not more. Uh, in the CV, and you can add up to five data sets and up to five software outputs. So if you have a, a diverse output, you have more chances to report it. Yeah, so if it's something, something missing in the sentence. And then when we look at these 10 publications and the five data sets and so on, we do a quality assessment of the best outputs. And the question that we ask is, does the applicant consistently produce high quality output? And we deliberately ignore any long tail of low quality publications that, that puff up the CV. So in typical career advice, uh, it is said, Yo, you, you need a long CV, you need some very strong publications in good journals, and then you need a long tail uh, to showcase your productivity. We suggest to ignore that completely. And now here's the last thought, and then uh, I'm, I'm finished. Um, we propose a two-step assessment. Uh, I told you about the low interrater agreement of reviewers. In fact, it's a bit more complicated, more differentiated, because we have actually a quite good agreement about low quality research. So if, if something is low quality, reviewers agree about that fact. But we have nearly no agreement about excellence. So if we look at the high end of the distribution of quality, we cannot predict and we do not agree upon what is very good, what is excellent and what is medium quality. And I think something like future scientific performance or even breakthroughs are hard or even impossible to predict. So based on these ideas, we would say, okay, so if we have a, a long list, these are all applicants who formally fit to the job description that we define a priori, a minimal level of rigor of quality that we expect. Um, and we cut off in the first step, the lower end of the distribution. So if a candidate never has open data, is not reproducible, never pre-registered, never provides analysis scripts, I would say this person does not demonstrate the, the craftsmanship that is necessary nowadays to, to do good research. So we filter them out. 
And then we have a, a selection of participants in the shortlist, and all of these would be generally qualified for the job. So there's no fail in this selection. But still, um, we have other criteria to, to look at them. And I would say in the second step, we need a narrative discourse about, for example, how innovative and meaningful the research is. There are no indicators, no metrics for that. There's no metric for innovation or for meaningfulness. You, you have to look at the papers. Probably you even have to read a paper of the applicant. What a crazy idea. Um, yeah, so we have, need to have a narrative discourse in the committee. And we must also consider all the other academic dimensions, such as teaching and societal impact on that stage. And then within that group, there's no more ranking. So metrics play no role anymore. And that means we can pick any candidate that, for example, has a good fit to the institution, who has very convincing uh, research proposals and whatever. And at least in Germany, at the end, we select usually three candidates. And then we ask the first candidate, do you want the job? And if not, we go down the list to the next one. So a two-step assessment. That would be our idea. And maybe a last thought about that. Um, Margit Osterloh and Bruno Frey, they suggest uh, a random selection here at step two. Because they say, we cannot really predict who will perform well. So as long as we cut out the, the bad research, we can do a random selection. And maybe it's even a better decision. And there, uh, there are examples at the University of Basel in the 18th um, century. They uh, reduced the shortlist to usually three candidates. And then they threw a dice uh, who got the position. And this random selection has many more good properties because it breaks all the old boys networks. It gives uh, really uh, innovative research a chance to, to um, well, to, to get funded, for example. Um, so it has many good properties. But I guess that most committees will not be willing to throw a dice at the end. So here's my summary. Current incentive structures foster bad science. Early career researchers feel attention. You can either do good science or have a career. And we seniors have the obligation to resolve that dilemma. And we have alternative ideas how to evaluate performance. So these things are, are there. Okay, so we should change our assessment practices today for hiring, promotion, tenure, for um, PhD agreements, for example. Yes, there are so many places where we evaluate research and we should look at all of them and see how we can change the, the incentives and the criteria uh, in a way that they foster good science and that good science is rewarded. So that was it. Thank you very much. And now I'm interested about your questions or challenges. Uh, here I am. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it was personally, I think it was a brilliant presentation and there are already two people who signed up with, with questions. One is Abhishek, I think. Sorry, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Um, you should be able to turn on your mic and ask your question yourself. Uh, yes, I'm, uh, am I audible? Yes. So thanks, Felix, Felix, for this wonderful presentation and very helpful for us early career researchers and ITR and also because they have been offering us say, these wonderful seminars. Uh, my question is on, uh, as you rightly said, about academic contribution. So if we consider interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary research as one of the criteria for academic contributions, and it's very difficult for early career researchers like us uh, to publish more when you are doing uh, interdisciplinary research, right? So how this uh, interdisciplinary research should be considered in the metrics uh, somewhere, at least for the early career researchers, because it's for me, it's very difficult. I'm new to the other discipline and I'm trying to publish. 
and surely i would have less number of publication because i am trying to understand the discipline itself let's say if i am major in philosophy and i'm trying to do something in psychology right or or vice versa so what mm -hmm. you have to say. yeah thanks so so i i totally share your impression that this is difficult so so most universities uh, the, the marketing departments of the universities say interdisciplinary is good but once you try to do it they they put all these hurdles and stones in your way uh, so it's really difficult yes um i think it's not properly um like reflected in the metrics you will probably always lose in the metrics what we propose is that if you have these 10 publications in your cv that you for every publication um, provide an impact statement or merit statement very short two or three sentences where you explain uh, why this publication is important and why this made made it into your top list of 10 publications and I hope that this narrative is a place where you can convince the committee that, well, this is something important, something special, um, that needs special consideration. And you could explicitly ask them not to look at the metrics, but to ask them to look at the intrinsic merits of, of the paper. So, um, yeah, so maybe that's half of an answer because the metrics probably will not reflect it. Um, no unless we develop a metric for interdisciplinarity, but um, I'm very off all metrics at the end of the day, so. Thank you. And I think next, uh, Christina had an answer. I have no one else signed up, so what is yours? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you, Felix. It was uh, really, convincing and also exciting because you showed us uh, that uh, indeed there are ways in which we can change to make science better and also uh, I think that especially changing the hiring procedures uh, would be particularly important because it really begins there right the way in which we do science begins in the also in this in the, in the fact that we need especially young people need to get hired and so it really can help change and and your proposal makes a lot of sense indeed but uh, so i totally uh, embrace the use of transparency and openness openness practices but my question has to do with uh, how easily it will be to really implement them. Uh, what I mean, uh, for instance, in uh, now you showed us that uh, at least in some universities, in some nations, uh, it is uh, advertised also, yeah, in, in the advertising that uh, uh, open science uh, practices are uh, important, are worth. But uh, I wonder whether there is the risk that it becomes kind of uh, open science washing, like the greenwashing, you know, and uh, so my question is, uh, what steps you think we should make to help implement these practices? Do you think that advertising them, uh, letting people know that we can do things in a better way is sufficient? Or should we uh, think about new strategies to, do you have ideas how we could, yeah, uh, help um, change these uh, hiring procedures? Mm -hmm. So I think open washing is a real risk and a real problem. So people now start to react to the open science movement and they say, well, okay, we have, we have new, new metrics, new rules of the game, let's play it by the new rules. Um, so the, the, the discourse about open science in, in my impression shifted a little bit. So a few years ago, we said openness is already the solution because then everybody can check, everybody can reproduce and find errors and so on, reuse all the data sets. Um, what turned out is that most of the data sets are not reusable because they are not documented properly. Uh, it turned out that pre-registrations make not too much sense because the paper simply does not follow the pre-registration without mentioning it and, and so on and so on. So that discourse now shifted uh, to the argument that openness is a necessary condition for quality control, but it's not sufficient. Because if nobody does the quality control, well, it can be as open as they want. Uh, it doesn't really help for the quality. So we need both. We need access to the raw data and the other stuff. 
that's the openness aspect and we need somebody doing the quality control so i think that's it um still i think that open research has higher quality on average because it has the potential to be checked and that's also something worth it, even if nobody has done it yet but yeah so concerning the open washing that means um in our proposals the applicants self-report all these quality indicators so for example if there has been a registration they say yes uh, check mark and please provide the link to the pre-registration so they could open wash simply apply by lying or putting on a bad pre-registration so at some stage somebody should look at it and evaluate it and that's why we also listed all these quality criteria for the different products so for example the, the pure presence of open data maybe is nice but it's even better if the data is fair and somebody checked the fairness of the data so it's not only openness but open plus high quality so I don't know if that answered all of your question. Uh, actually, I was thinking, well, first, but open washing also from the point of the view of the university, who can say, okay, you see, we have, we have put open science in the advertisement, so we have done our job and that's it. So they don't, maybe they put it in the advertisement of the job, but then do they use it? This is one of the questions. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. And so, yeah, yeah, let me answer that before I forget yeah. it so much. <laughs> Working memory is limited. Uh, um, I think that happens, yes. They, they put it in the advertisement and don't really consider it in the committee work itself. But still, I think it has an effect because the applicants do not know in, it, in advance whether they uh, recognize it or not. So in order to be strategically uh, on the job market, they should have some credentials about open science. Um, yeah, so I think it still has an effect, even if they ignore it, in fact. Yeah, and the other point was, uh, how can we uh, how can we do to make the process to change? Uh, uh, well, happen, first of all, and happen as fast as possible, because, yeah, it's important. And uh, I wonder if it is enough to advertise that we can do things differently or if there is anything else that we can do besides trying to be in the hiring committees, of course, and trying to use you know, these uh, yeah, new ways of hiring people. Yeah, of course, uh, you could try to infiltrate the hiring committees and uh, <laughs> talk to them and convince them to change the rules. Um, yeah, I often get the question, so like, what is the single most important level that we have to push to change things? And I thought a lot about that. And my current conclusion is there is not a single level. It's like more interconnected wheels and we have to change many things at the same time. So some people say it's incentive structures. Others say, no, it's the publishing system. When the journals change, then everything changes and so on. I think we need to to change everything at once, more or less. So for example, these open science practices need skills. So people have to learn how to do it. Um, and it doesn't make too much sense to change the criteria for hiring positions and change the criteria in journals and do not teach people how to do the behavior because even if they want to, they cannot show the behavior. So we need education, we need change of the incentive structure, we need change of the journal system. Um, yeah, maybe these are and and funding, so that's uh, another big one. Thank you. Thank you. If we have time, there's one more question from Vittorio. I think we do have time. Yeah, thanks. So uh, my question would be related to uh, alt metrics, something that relates also with uh, what Christina was asking. Uh, I really like the concept behind uh, alt metrics uh, and that they they relate to information that could be uh, that could not be represented by classic metrics and uh, they do it uh, as soon as possible right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really like uh, the concept of alt metrics themselves. I also like the fact that basically they could be associated with every uh, object that uh, has a DOI, so it's not like ma just manuscripts, it's also uh, data sets and 
code and so on. But my question somehow uh, relates with uh, what Christina was asking. So a piece of software or a video tutorial that actually may have a great impact of a researcher professional life, maybe a bigger impact or biggest impact because uh, I choose, for example, uh, to, to use one software to analyze data uh, with respect to, to other softwares, it could change my entire professional life. And I think that if on one hand, it's necessary to include this effort when depicting a professional profile. On the other hand, I would ask you whether there should be a way to uh, somehow quantify the scientific quality of all these kind of uh, unidentified uh, uh, research objects. So whether there should be, be introduced a, a peer review system for data sets or for uh, video tutorials or uh, all these objects that are more and more used in uh, research life, but they really do not uh, undergo a peer review uh, process. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for me, everything gets much clearer when you separate these dimensions of evaluation, quality, impact, and quantity, and never mix it up and do not use an indicator of that for the other one. So as long as you are aware that altmetrics are an impact indicator, which is independent of quality, I think then it's really fine. And I agree they are much faster than citations. They have a broader scope uh, than citations. So I like altmetrics for impact. So, uh, and it's quite easy to construct examples where um, the, the dimensions dissociate. For example, if you do that tutorial video, um, you can explain like a very simple concept like a t-test, okay? And this gets really famous. And after that, thousands of researchers do better t-tests than they did before and do less errors and so on. Then it was a valuable contribution, but it probably was not of high scientific originality because the t-test exists for, I don't know, 100 years already. Uh, you didn't invent anything new, but you did a great teaching tool and you had a lot of impact. So uh, I would say, okay, scientific value is low, but uh, impact for the field on the teaching dimension is very high. Yeah, and once you accept that these dimensions exist, these different, and, and you don't try to put everything into one unidimensional ranking. So this person is a better researcher than the other person. Uh, as long as you keep the multidimensionality, it's fine. Then you can have high values here, low values here, and then you have a profile instead of a single dimensional ranking of, of people. I see, this is really interesting. Thank you so much for, for this answer. I had to, to see and think about this, but it's, I think it's, uh, it's really fascinating, really interesting. Thank you so much. Okay, we don't have any more questions. I, if I can, uh, it's not exactly a question, it's more of a, of a first impression, but thank you really, because somehow, uh, I think a lot of things seem more uh, more in reach, more within reach, more feasible, and it kind of makes the picture a bit more bright and more hopeful, even for, for young researchers, <laughs> because sometimes trying to, to navigate the moment of change is sometimes really cool and sometimes a bit disheartening. So thank you very much. Thank you a lot. Thank you a lot, Felix. And yeah, I think if there are no other questions, maybe we can wrap it up with the, well, this was the last seminar of this year. I want to thank you all the speakers, the attendee, everybody uh, for this uh, great series of seminars. Okay, I, sh I shouldn't be the one who says it is, this is great, great because we organized it, but uh, I really think that uh, it has been an amazing series of seminars. And uh, yeah, this last talk has been really amazing uh, also. Um, a few questions, a few things just to, uh, a few reminders. First of all, uh, as usual, uh, we will receive the attendees, we receive an email 
the, the, who's, the people who ask for it will receive the email uh, certifying the attendance uh, in the next uh, seven days. So um, be a little bit patient. If you do not receive it in the next week, then you can contact us uh, if you need it to receive it. And uh, remember, uh, I'll, um, uh, yeah, I already mentioned it in the beginning. We will have the first hands-on uh, education, uh, first hands-on open science uh, seminar on uh, pre-registration, and uh, it is on June 19th. And you can uh, enroll by going on uh, our webpage or by um, yeah. Uh, uh, using the register here uh, stuff. And I don't think there is anything else that I should say, or did I, I, am I forgetting anything? I'm asking to the other people of the educational work group. Oh yes, that we probably, we should uh, uh, re uh, remind you to, uh, enroll in the Italian Reproducibility Network if you have not already, so you can keep posted with all of our uh, activities. And uh, um, on YouTube, we will uh, upload the Felix's video uh, in the next uh, days. And uh, I think that's it. And so thank you all. And yeah, take care. Bye bye to everybody. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>